everybody, this is Daniel here with Propelio again, and we're going to be talking about continuing through the pre-foreclosure process. And we're going to run through in this specific class everything you should be considering before the appointment, before you actually go out and drive to the house. There's going to be a list of things that you should have prepared to make the results of your appointment the best they can possibly be. One of the very first things that I'm going to always recommend is before you even step foot of your house is to call that seller and say, hey, I just wanted to confirm that we're still on for our appointment today. You do not want a bunch of wasted time driving all across your town trying to find these houses and then show up and the sellers are not there. So before you leave the house, make sure that your appointment is confirmed. It will save you a massive amount of time. There's other things that we're going to need to do before we leave the house. We're going to want to know the details of this house. We're going to want to know what the owner's name and mailing address is. We should obviously know that already from, uh, from the conversation, but we're going to confirm that in the local tax appraisals website. If you're not sure what the tax appraisal website is, just whatever your county is, just say, or whatever your city is, um, Dallas County Tax Appraiser, Tarrant County Tax Appraiser. You do that and it'll pull it up or pull up the central appraisal district. Some places call it different stuff. So I say Dallas, Dallas County Appraisal District, Tarrant County Appraisal District, Parker County Appraisal District. Search for that. And then once you get that information pulled up, type in the address of the property and you should be able to find the owner's name and mailing address, size, age, and attributes of the house. If you had not already done this on the phone call, I would imagine that you did. But if you didn't, this is where you're going to need to do it. And then you're going to want to know what the appraised value of the property is. Now, don't mistake the appraised value of the property for being what the home is worth. So many homeowners will use the appraised value for what they think their home is worth. All the appraised value is is the price point that the city and or county has placed on the property for taxing purposes. More often than not, that value is probably 10% lower than what the home is actually worth in its complete and total ready to sell condition. Uh, so when you actually go out there, you may be offering less than the appraised value, but don't use that appraised value for any sort of CMA or data like that. Okay, we're going to want to know the area. Some things you're going to want to know when you're analyzing this property is, does it match the neighborhood style? You know, there's, here's a funny story. I get a phone call one day and this guy's in pre-foreclosure. He's going to go to foreclosure in the next, I don't know, week or so. And he's motivated on the phone. This guy is just like, yep, I, I know I, I'm going to foreclosure. I'm not, I'm not playing around. I need a home gone. I'm, I'm done with this. Just come on by, give me an offer and, and I'm ready to go. I'm sitting here thinking score. And while I'm on the phone with him, I run the comps in the neighborhood. And I'm going to use numbers because I don't remember. This was years ago. It was like $180,000. And this guy over the phone, I pitched him at about that $90,000 mark. And he's like, you know what? Go for it. I don't care. Let's do it. And I'm sitting here thinking, score. We've got a deal. I drive over there. And I'm going to tell you this up front because I'm embarrassed. It was on a cul-de-sac. I'm driving down, and as I'm getting into the cul-de-sac, I see a house. And I was like, please don't let it be that house. Please don't let it be that house. I'm, I, I should have looked this up on Google Earth before I left. Please don't let that be the house. I pull into the cul-de-sac, 112, 115, 118. And I'm like, that's the house. You know what I did? I just kept driving. I didn't even stop. I didn't even get out for my appointment. What happened? Why? Because on the phone, I knew what he owed on the house. And then when I showed up to the house, I saw what the house was. If you all, if y'all are not familiar with a term called geodome, there was a geodome right in the middle of a mid-century modern neighborhood. Like every house over there was just a single story, three bed, two bath, 1500 square foot home with a two car garage. Very typical house, nothing different, except for right in the middle of this cul-de-sac was a geodome. I'm sorry, I'm not buying a geodome in the middle of a cul-de-sac. There's no comparable sales. The ability to sell that property on the market is going to be limited to a very specific buyer. And regardless of the discount I got on that, at that price, $90,000 was not enough of a discount for me to buy it. And I knew what he owed on it because I had the conversation with him on the phone. He can't take less than ninety. dollars and I'm not buying a geodome for 90 grand in the middle of a mid-century modern neighborhood. Not doing it. So make sure that the home matches the style. That was a very off-the-cuff off like explanation. But like if I'm in a neighborhood and I've got, let's say, a bunch of like this is common here in DFW in some markets. We'll have a bunch of mid-century modern homes, like that 1950s, 60s home. And then in that will also be sprinkled a bunch of like 1930s Tudor style homes. 
Well, if I'm looking at the Tudor style homes, I cannot compare those to the mid centuries because that area was built up in phases. Well, I can't compare the two. If I've got a Tudor style house, I need to compare it to a Tudor style house. If I got a Victorian, I need to compare it to a Victorian. If I've got a modern, I should compare it to modern. Those are some key things that you should be looking for. Um, and then are there any location issues? And what I mean by that is if I pop out on Google Maps and I look at a satellite view, is this home like on a backing up to an apartment complex? Is it backing up to a commercial complex? Is it on a busy street? You know, is it sitting right next door to a gas station? Those are things that are problems with the location. The home might, you know, say that comps out for 200,000, but once I find out the location of the home, the demand for it is gonna go down significantly because nobody wants to live right next door to the gas station. So keep an eye out for location issues and then know your numbers. You're gonna need to know what your numbers are directly before you go to the house. That's gonna be, you know, use a software platform like Propelio. Propelio can get you comps instantaneously across the United States at any given point in time. If you don't have access to Propelio, which I have no clue, clue why you wouldn't, go check out and get with a licensed real estate agent. A licensed real estate agent should be able to quickly give you a value for that property. I do have to provide a little bit of warnings there, not, um, not, not, not anything to scare you, but a, a, it's an opinion of value. If I ask a real estate agent, what do you think that home is worth? Their opinion may be higher or lower than yours. Their opinion may be higher or lower than the markets. Just be aware that if you're asking a real estate agent, that you make sure you're talking to a competent real estate agent because it takes about two weeks to get your license and you don't really want to be talking to somebody that doesn't have a whole lot of experience. So make sure you're talking to the right real estate agent. And then as always, you can always talk to a licensed real estate appraiser. They're going to charge you money though. They're going to charge you anywhere between like hundred bucks, 75 bucks for a desktop appraisal. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't go through a whole lot of that. Real estate agents will often be a good resource for you if you're able to make a good connection with one that's knowledgeable, but always in, in, in it'll probably be your best option is go to propelio.com. You can get your, you can get your comps from there. Estimated equity. What is the estimated value of the home compared to how many liens are against it? So if there's $50,000 worth of liens on the home and I know it's worth hundred grand, there's 50,000 in equity. If there's 70,000 in liens on the home and it's worth hundred grand, there's 30,000 in equity. Well, some of the things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull it up in the county clerk's records. The county clerks here in DFW are almost all online. If yours are not online, then you may have a little bit of a hiccup and you may not wanna to have to go out and research all that. But once again, in Propelio, you can see a lot of the liens recorded in Propelio. So there's a good resource for you. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see how many liens there are. Do I have a first position lien? Do I have any second or third position liens? Do I have mechanics liens? Do I have affidavits of fact filed against the property? Or excuse me, um, excuse me, what are those called? Um, Oh, what are those called? Let me think, 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 AJs. I always call them AJs because I, I don't ever call them anything. Abstracts of judgments. There you go. Are there any abstracts of judgments filed against the property? Because what may happen is if I'm on the phone with this seller and, you know, I know that the home's going to be worth a hundred grand and they're wanting to sell it to me. And I'm like, well, you know, if I could get in that 50 to $60,000 range, would you consider selling it to me? And the seller says yes. But then I hang up on the phone and I start researching county, county records and I find out that there's $170,000 worth of liens against the house. I might want to call that seller back and be like, hey, are you familiar with this abstract of judgment filed against this property? Are you familiar with this child support lien? Are you familiar with this, with this second lien? Are you familiar with this mechanics lien for the air conditioning system? And then the seller starts saying, oh yeah, well, I know about that one. I know about that one. I was like, well, have you paid any of these off? And if they end up saying no, that doesn't mean I'm not gonna to go to the appointment. I'm just gonna change my paperwork up because it's no longer a, a cash purchase. It's now a short sale. I'm gonna to have to do something a little bit different to take that deal down. But I'm gonna search for the parcel in the appraisal district or county, uh, county clerk's records, and I'm gonna search for the owner's name, and I'm gonna see if there's anything coming up against that property, so that way I'm not blindsided when I get to the appointment or whenever I submit this contract to title before I go to, before I go to close on it. All right, so I'm, I need to know what my, my exit strategy is gonna be. I've probably determined that up front on my phone call. What I mean by knowing what my exit strategy is, am I gonna wholesale this property? Am I gonna end up holding it? Am I gonna flip it? Am I gonna do some level of creative financing on it? Am I gonna short it? You know, this, this should have all been taken care of during my phone call with the seller. You know, if I know that I'm getting a, dip, de uh, a decent enough discount that I can wholesale it and I wanna do that, I need to, my, I need to prepare my paperwork for wholesaling. If it's gonna be something I'm planning on buying and holding, well, then I might want to structure my contracts a little bit differently because it's something that I know that I'm going to keep for long term. 
Well, what if I'm planning on flipping it? Does that change any of my paperwork? Ultimately though, before I even show up to the house, I have a preconceived idea of what I plan on doing with the home based upon my previous conversations with the homeowner, okay? So now that I know what I'm gonna do with it, I need to get my paperwork set up before I show up to the appointment. Getting the paperwork set up can be a lot of different things. Cash purchase agreement, creative financing packets. I'm gonna take this down subject to, I'm gonna JV the wholesaler. What am I gonna do there? Can I short it? Am I planning on shorting? And what do I mean by shorting? If you haven't seen the short sale class offered here by Melody Medley, uh, go check that out. That, that class is amazing. That girl is by far like the short sale queen. She is the best. Melody Medley, oh yes, yeah, real estate, go check her out. But a short sale pack is where I take a property that is owed more than it's worth and I get the bank to agree to sell it for what I offered. So let's say they owe 120 on it. I don't wanna buy it for, for any more than 100 and I talk to the bank and I get the bank to sell it to me for 100. That's a short sale. Uh, I need to have seller's disclosures with me. I need to have third party authorizations with me. Third party authorizations are extremely important to you when you're working pre foreclosures. That third party authorization is the seller giving me and my team the right to communicate to the bank and the trustee and or the attorneys handling the foreclosures on that seller's behalf. Without that paperwork, the banks aren't gonna to talk to me, the trustee's not gonna to talk to me. I need that third party authorization and I also need an authorization to release information. Uh, kind of a similar thing, in Texas we have the authorization to release information. I pass that paperwork on to the title company and then the title company can use that paperwork to also talk to the banks and talk to the attorneys. Okay, there's more. There's a lot more that I would consider having with me. I keep what I call like my toolbox in my car at all times and it's a expandable file folder. And I've got about 30 to 40 different contracts in there, 30 to 40 different addendums, uh, additional paperwork that I want to have with me at all times. Uh, bankruptcy packet. Bankruptcy packet, I am, I am and never will be a cheerleader for bankruptcy. What I will say, though, is that there will be situations, while I find them to be rare, that a homeowner is probably in a situation where they should consider bankruptcy. Well, I have a network of bankruptcy attorneys. Bankruptcy attorneys work with people in pre-foreclosure quite often. And I have a connection of those and I will say, hey, do you have a basic questionnaire entry, you know, bankruptcy, you know, entry form that you use for your bankruptcies? And I'll use theirs and I'll show up on a property. And if it's very clear that that seller should likely consider filing bankruptcy, I will give them that paperwork and I will give them the referral to that attorney. So that way they might be able to start down that process because it's probably the best option for them. Okay, other things I'll have, lead-based paint disclosures, HOA condo information, like if it's in a homeowner's association, I'll need some specific paperwork. If it's in a condo, I'll need specific paperwork. What you don't want to have happen is to show up to the appointment and realize that you don't have all the paperwork that you need. Now, if you're new to this business and you're wholesaling and you're like, oh, I'm, I need this paperwork, I need that paperwork. Yes, you're going to need this paperwork over time. But don't let this slow you down. Don't let this get you scared that, oh, I can't go on an appointment because I don't have condo information. Just go on the appointment and if it ends up being a condo, guess what? You're gonna need that paperwork. But don't let that be an excuse to not do anything. You're gonna need, you could use leaseback addendums. One of the primary things that I use in my negotiation with sellers is the, the, the simple fact that a lot of these people do not know where they're gonna go they don't have the money to go and they don't know what they're going to do. So if I have variancing, very, very, various different leasebacks set up so that way when I'm sitting down with the seller, I'm like, hey, what are your plans for moving? Do you have some place to go? What? You don't have some place to go? Well, then, hey, here's a leaseback addendum that I can use for you. And I'll give you two weeks after closing to get all your affairs in order so that way you can move on. I'll use that as a negotiation piece. So I like to have leaseback addendums with me. I talk about those in depth in a different, in a different topic here on the pre-foreclosure force course. So I'm not going to get in deep on those, but I keep those with me. I also keep airship affidavit questionnaires with me. Airship affidavits. What is that? Well, if a, if a, if the owner of a property has died, and they have not transferred title to their heirs, an option, at the very least in Texas, and I do believe is common across the United States, is what's called an affidavit of heirship. Affidavits of heirship will transfer title from the decedent, decedent meaning the deceased person, down to their heirs. Now, depending on what state you're in, that might be called something different, but there's probably gonna be something similar in your state outside of probate. Probate is one way of doing it, but probate involves a court and a judge and it takes some time, Affidavits of airship normally only take, you know, 24 
to 72 hours, depending on how fast you can make things happen. Affidavits of airship can be done very quickly. So I keep those on, on with me because if I show up to the appointment and I find out that there's a broken chain of title, I want to resolve it right then and there. Other things I keep with me is a call to, what I call a credibility pack. If I'm showing up to this appointment, this seller is in a very confused state of life. They've got a lot of problems going on. They've, they're dealing with whatever issue put them into foreclosure. Now they're dealing with the foreclosure and there's just some headache involved with their home. So, or it just, their, their whole life is not really in the best of places right now. So some of the things that I'm going to do to help ease their mind is bring to with them what I call my credibility pack. I'm gonna show them testimonials of other sellers that I've worked with. I'm gonna show them statistics revolving around foreclosure as well as other ways of stopping the foreclosure. You will often find that a person in foreclosure will have heard of loan modifications, heard of deed in lieu, heard of you know forbearance agreements. They will have heard of these things, but they're not 100% sure what they are, how they work. Well, with this, what we're gonna have is I'll bring statistics saying, okay, we've got loan modifications, for instance. Well, statistically shown, and I'm just throwing some numbers out there because I don't have them sitting right in front of me, 88% of people that go into loan modifications still end up in foreclosure. All right, that's a good statistic to know. Something else that might want to know is that, you know, of 382,000 loan modification applications submitted to Bank of America in 2012, only 319 of them were approved. So if you're planning on using a loan modification for stopping this foreclosure for you, you need to understand that your likelihood of this happening is very slim. Now, all those numbers I just threw out there were numbers that pulled off the top of my head, but I'll go out and I'll, prior to showing up to the appointment, look through the 12 different ways of stopping a foreclosure. I'll put together a credibility packet saying, okay, here's the 12 ways to stop it. Here's what each and every single one of them are. Here's the benefits, pros and cons to all of these different things. And here's the probabilities shown from X, Y, and Z resource of this working out for you. Those are just some things that I will do up hand because my job on that appointment, first and foremost, is to be an educator. I need to educate that seller on all of their options and then let them choose which one is going to be best for them. Okay, process explanations. Okay, if we do this, this is step one. We're going to put together all of what we just discussed into a purchase agreement. We'll submit that purchase agreement to the title company. The title company will reach back out to you with questions. We'll move forward. We'll do this. We'll do that. Explain to that seller from beginning to end what this process will look like so that way it will ease their concerns. The better you are at making this seller feel comfortable with what's going to happen, the higher the probability of you doing a deal with them will be. Copies of public filings help me out as well. If I know this property is in pre-foreclosure, I will print out the notice of trustee sale. I will print out the appointments of substitute trustee. I will point out, I'll print out all the mechanics liens, abstracts of judgments, um, first and second position liens. I'll print those all out from county clerks and I'll bring those with me so that way while I'm there, I can be like, hey, this was filed, this was filed, this was filed. It just makes me feel more credible when I'm dealing with the seller. And then any outline of state foreclosure. I find that one to be a very key piece in my credibility packet because so many of these sellers have no honest clue as to what's gonna happen to their home or how the process starts. So if you can really outline what your state's foreclosure process looks like, it is a service to that seller that that seller can lean back on to have a better understanding of what's being done to them. Okay, such as, okay, in the state of Texas, there is due process. I need to send you a letter up front stating that you are in default and there is an acceleration. I'm demanding that all of this paperwork or all of the money owed to me is repaid in the next 20 days. And if you don't, I'm going to start the foreclosure process. That's the demand letter. All right, the next part, the 21 day uh, notice of foreclosure. Minimum of 21 day notice that the foreclosure will occur. Where will it occur? What time will it occur? Where? You know, all of these things. I outline that into a very clear document so that way the seller knows what the foreclosure process is in Texas. Well, what happens if the home goes to auction? Well, it's either going to be purchased at the auction by a cash buyer or it's going to be retained by the bank and it's going to go back to the bank. Well, if it's bought by the by, the, by a cash buyer, there's a good probability that within 24 hours of the auction, you're going to get a knock on your front door from somebody saying, hey, I now own your home and you're living in the home that I own. I'm going to have to ask that you move. Okay. If you don't move, then that person will then follow up and go to eviction court. They're going to file what's called a forcible detainer suit. And once they file this forcible detainer suit, they're now going to send a constable to your house to serve you paperwork to show up to court. And then once you go to court, they're going to go, hey, judge, this person is still in the home. I bought it at an auction. And then the judge is likely going to evict you from the home. 
If you then still don't leave the home, well, then the person that bought the house is going to have to file what's called a writ of possession. And I'll outline this entire process for them so they can clearly understand what the reality that they are facing entails. Because some of them, if not all of them, really have no understanding of what's going on. They're kind of just riding the wave and hoping that things work out. It's kind of good for you to come in and help educate them. Other things I'll have is an actual toolbox. That actual toolbox will have some things in the home in there that I like to have with me to inspect the property. A video camera, that's first and foremost because I want documentation of what the property looks like. I will take photos of the electrical panels, the HVAC equipment, the hot water, uh, the water heater equipment, the, uh, I'll go through and find out if I've got any foundation issues, figure out if I've got a solid roof on it, see if there's any obvious mechanical or plumbing issues, all things that I'm going to want to have on this home documented while I'm there. I will also want a flashlight. Sometimes, you know, lights don't work in rooms. There's no electricity on at the house. Flashlights are good for you. Kind of shine some light around in the attic underneath the house. If it's a pier and beam, you're going to want a flashlight with you. I like to keep a change of clothes and coveralls with me. Some of the houses you go into are not houses you want to be in. And a, for me personally, I don't recommend this for everybody, but for me personally, if it's a property that I plan to buy, I will go in the attic and I will go underneath the house because I don't want any surprises. Now, could you and or should you outsource that to other people? Yes, that's kind of me though. I like, I like to know what I'm buying. Uh, three, foot or, three foot or larger level. Uh, what I use those for is determining um, the foundation in the home. The reason I started doing that, because most of the time you show up to a house and you're like, boom, you know, foundation issues, it's obvious. Uh, well, it is obvious unless you buy a house that moves all at once. Don't ask me how I know this. I've lost money on it. Well, the entire house did not just like one little corner of the house did not just fall like that and break. The entire house moved like that. Like, I'm going to exaggerate it so you can see, but nothing broke in the house. None of the brick broke, none of the sheetrock broke because the entire house moved. And with the entire house moving, I didn't realize that there was a foundation issue. But I now bring a level with me, and I put a level in each and every room to see that if the, if the home is sitting fairly level. I bring a tape measure that gives me the ability to help out with estimating my rehab costs. How many, link, how, how many feet of cabinets do I have? How much tile do I need? How much carpet do I need? And in some ways, some people might argue with me on this. For me, I was, I was, there's different ways of going about this business and there's always differing point of views. I'm going to give you my point of view on this. I was getting a lot of contracts from other investors that were not getting the contracts because of the amount of time I was spending with the seller at the home. It came across as though I was a little more credible. Whenever I go through and I start measuring some of the rooms and I start coming up with some remodel budgets, it just gave me A, more time to speak and talk with the seller, and B, it just came across as though I was a little more professional. I'd have a nice little spreadsheet out there and I'd start filling in all that information. There are plenty of other people that'll say all that is wasted work. And in some areas I can agree, in other areas I disagree. It was my style. It was what I like to do. Uh, I have a little giant ladder with me. Uh, they're little three foot ladders or so that expand out to be like nine foot extension ladders. And I'd use that to get up on the roof. I'd always want to look at the roof before I purchased the home. Uh, a 10 in one screwdriver so I can open up some, um, some, um, uh, some plugs on the walls. I want to see if I've got aluminum wiring in there, open up the electric panel, see if I've got anything crazy going on in there. And then a hammer slash pry bar. If I show up to a house that's boarded up, I need to get into it. So I'd keep those things with me. Be prepared. I always want to double check that I've paperwork is printed and that I've got it ready for it to go with me. I've got all my tools in the car, that I got pen and paper in the car. There's nothing more embarrassing than showing up and not being able to find a pen or paperwork. And then I always keep backup paperwork. I always print three copies. One copy for me, one copy for the seller, and one copy in case I mess up. So I always print off at least three copies. And then while I'm on the way to the property, I want to leave early. And while I'm, while I'm leaving early, I'm not just going to go there and just listen to DMX while I'm driving there. I'm going to go there and I'm going to listen to something that kind of puts me in the right mindset of going to this, some motivational something. I want to get my mind in the right state. And through doing that, I'm going to rehearse what I'm going to do when I get there. I'm going to go through making the offer. I know what my numbers are. I'm going to go through and rehearse what I'm thinking about and just try and get my brain in that spot where I need to be to show up to that house. Uh, like I said, listen to motivational music. But once I get there, I'm going to go ahead and drive through the neighborhood. And while I'm driving through the neighborhood, I'm going to see what, what the neighborhood's been doing. Is, am I seeing a lot of flips going on in there? Can I see homes that have obviously been remodeled? What does the neighborhood require for me to do to this house? If none of the windows in the neighborhood have been replaced, then I might not need to include that in my repair budget. 
does every home in the neighborhood have new windows and the home I'm showing up to doesn't? Well, then I might need to look at that. But I'm going to look at overall the uh, what's going on in the neighborhood. Does it feel like it is a uh, neighborhood that I want to flip in? Does it feel like it's a neighborhood that I'd want to do renting in? Uh, does it feel like, you know, just get an idea of what's going on in the neighborhood and that'll help you gauge what's going on with the house when you show up. Uh, I'm also showing up early so I can drop some bandit signs. I'll start dropping bandit signs around the neighborhood because I'm already in the neighborhood. Why not drop some bandit signs around? And then the last but not least thing is whenever I show up to the house, I'm going to park in the street. That's a little tip that I got from Jason Riney. Uh, it's a mental thing, but it leaves the seller not feeling like they're trapped. And let's say the seller's parked in the driveway and then I pull in and I park right behind them. It sounds stupid and I have no clue if it has any credibility to it, but I was told by Jason that I should park in the street and there's no reason for me not to park in the street. So from now on, I always park in the street. Okay. When I get there, I didn't put that on there, uh, but walking up to the house. When you walk up to the house and you knock on the door, don't just stand there six inches from the door and wait for it to open. Knock on the door and take a big couple of steps back. Get way away from that door. So that way, whenever, you're work, whenever the seller comes to the door, they don't feel like they're, they're being, their space is being encroached upon. Give them plenty of space. Let them open the door. Introduce yourself from a little ways back. Just say, hi, Mr. or Mrs. Seller. My name's Daniel Moore. I work with I-35 Home Buyers. I had an appointment with you today. Is it okay if I walk around the house with you? Just give them a little bit of space. Let them feel that distance. But overall, review your notes because proper preparation is going to equal results. You go through, and I don't say do all of this for every phone call you get. Do this for every phone call you get an appointment on. Because if you do this for every phone call you get, you're going to be doing a bunch of busy work. But what you're going to do is whenever you do have an appointment set, if you go through and you get all of your preparation done up front, you're going to have a higher level of confidence when you get to the house and you're going to have the right paperwork and you're going to know what your numbers are. So you're not standing there with the seller trying to figure out what to do. I think this is an important piece in the process. And if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please drop them in the comments below. I look forward to your feedback and I'll see you on the next video.